drugs spilled on battlefields all over the world is being replaced by a dramatic supply system. At Naples, the 15th Medical General Laboratory, only base unit of its kind in the Mediterranean theater, was established in January 1944 to supply the great need for whole blood, whose early use in counteracting shock and hemorrhage is even more important than blood plasma. There's no scarcity of depositors in this blood bank. Frontliners and those in forward areas know with the Army Medical Department that whole blood and blood plasma are the foremost lifesavers of the war. And with major sacrifices so close by, everyone wants to make this minor sacrifice. Donors are first checked for disease, colds, rashes, anything which might damage the quality of their contribution. Once okayed and typed, they're ready to do their share to save a life. A little Novocaine injected first makes the bleeding needles feel like a feather tip. And the only thing donors feel after this is a personal participation in the war. To prevent damage to the blood from splashing, the vacuum collecting bottle is inverted. While donations are being made, a medical officer is present at all times and frequent personnel checks are made. Donors are mostly rear echelon soldiers and base section troops, along with transient Army and Navy men many of whom received this bank's blood themselves after being wounded and are now repaying the loan. Even convalescent patients like to get back on these cots. But whether dog face or whack, sailor or flyer, all are red cellmates. In this work, there are no separate arms. The only arm that counts is the arm that gives its life-saving blood for someone else. And in this work, all blood is the same color and the same quality. While the donor rests after giving blood, a technician takes his or her pint to the laboratory for processing. All rubber tubing, valves, and needles used to draw the blood are taken to the washing room. Tubing is drained into a test tube, and a sample is put aside for further testing. The apparatus is then sterilized and reassembled. Meanwhile, a small pilot bottle containing another blood sample is attached to the pint bottle for further cross-matching tests in the field just before use. From now on, the whole blood must be kept refrigerated at all times, lest it deteriorate. Even so, at this base, it's considered worthless after seven days. The blood samples are next taken to serology, where they receive a number of tests, before their matching refrigerated bottles are sorted, tagged, and shipped. Many of these involve blood serum, and to prepare this, the samples are placed in a centrifuge, which separates the serum from the blood cells. important tests is the con test for syphilis. Without getting technical, this includes an analysis of the clear serum of the blood. At blood collecting stations all over the world, these same tests are conducted. This station isn't an indication that the people at home are falling down on their job of donating whole blood. There are five centers on the west coast and five on the east supplying whole blood. But since it's highly perishable, and since it's impossible for the armed forces to tell how much they will need from day to day, it's been found better to depend in part on overseas units for supply. After a thorough run of the specimen, the con tests are read and recorded. Another important test is for blood grouping. Drops of known A, B, and O cells are mixed with the donor serum to determine correctness in grouping. Wrong grouping may result in the death of the patient, for it makes the cells clot. Blood titer, that is, the concentration of clotting factors, must be tested also, since mixing bloods of high and low titer may be dangerous. Only type O is accepted for whole blood transfusions because it's a universal type which may safely be administered to any patient. Blood smears are also closely examined for malaria. After these various tests, the bottles are taken to a topping room, which is guarded against dust particles. Here, they're checked against the test reports, and all rejections are weeded out. Capped, each bottle is punctured with a sterilized needle, and a dextrose and saline solution is added to preserve the blood and prevent the breakup of red cells. Now properly labeled, final sorting starts. 
High tighter blood is set aside, distinctively tagged, and as a further check against error, these bottles are stored separately. Then back to the icebox again to await that trip up front. And that's not long. These bottles are used as fast as they're filled. The allied demand for them is great, for smashing the powerful armies of our fascist enemies is bloody work. At the time for shipment, bottles are transferred from the big refrigerators to insulated wooden boxes. These boxes, incidentally, were improvised largely from parts of abandoned enemy equipment. The boxes are then loaded into a refrigerator truck and taken to waiting planes. Speed of the courier plane service is the most vital factor in the successful use of whole blood. And its reliability under all hazards is one of the war's great documents of man's efforts to help man. The air crews perform a stirring job in delivering the blood. During rapid advances, locations of frontline hospitals often change quickly, and the crews must be prepared to land transports at alternate fields. Weather doesn't stop them. And GIs sum up appreciation with the modest boast that the blood plane goes through even when the birds are grounded. Toward the end of 1944, these planes shuttled from Naples to central France, whence their cargo was trucked to the front. Victory had been fought with many casualties, and field hospitals needed whole blood desperately, as they will on every front, until all blood-spilling weapons are taken from every German and every Jap. These hospitals are just a couple of miles from where the flesh is ripped and the blood runs out. And here is where, as the wounded move back, the blood must move up. Time is short now, and the bottles must be quickly handled. And there must be enough of them, for a man might need eight or more pints before medics mend his shattered chest. But before even that, every bottle must be cross-matched, not only with the man's dog tag, but cross-matched with his own blood as a final check. There can be no mistakes here, for to use the wrong blood now would be serious. Untiring technicians label each tested bottle with the patient's name and untiring nurses take it away for immediate use. Here in the shock ward where the first bottle of red-celled whole blood is given, a man really starts his big fight, the fight against shock, the fight for life. Here he gets a studied examination by the medics, and when his condition permits, he's moved around the corner into the operating tent, the bottle of life-saving fluid moving right with him. And even before the surgeons have rewashed their hands, a fresh bottle is in place. Now, not hearing the constant roar of nearby guns, but only a man's heartbeat, noble men and women can proceed with their noble work and make it avail because of whole blood and blood plasma. Without it, they have said, our mortality rate would double right on this table. With it, with this great stream of blood from a whack in Naples or a combat engineer, from millions of men in arms and from more millions of friends, relatives, workers at home, all races intermingle and flow into wounded men everywhere to bring them new life.